After the untimely death of the young King Edwig, who may or may not have been assassinated in favour of his younger and more agreeable brother, Edgar, or better known as Edgar the Peaceful, for obvious reasons, succeeded him. As we discussed in the last episode, Edwig's rule was not a popular one, and his reign was marked with strife, turmoil, and even the threat of the utter dissolution of a united England. In fact, the Thanes of Mercia and Northumbria had already come to shun Eardwig in the years leading up to his death, and they chose to recognise the more affable Edgar as their king instead. But when Eardwig died, Edgar at the young age of 19 would restore the sense of union within the country, and tensions created by his older brother were soon eased. One of the main ways that tensions were eased was through the reinstating of St Dunstan, who Edwig had banished before. The two had a rather public dislike of one another, especially when St Dunstan had interrupted the young king whilst he was having a threesome, and publicly shamed him for it thereafter. The bitter rivalry between Edwig and St Dunstan is well documented throughout history, and it would see the young king send away the influential advisor, a controversial decision given that St Dunstan had not only advised previous kings with diligence, but also acquired considerable allies within the court. But as we know, Edgar would be a very different king to Eardwig, and seemed more concentrated on the needs of the kingdom, as opposed to his own wants and needs. At the mere age of 19, Edgar demonstrated noteworthy traits of maturity, those that saw him well liked amongst his subjects. It was in the year 959 when he was crowned king, which would see him consolidate the political unity that the kings before him had worked to achieve. Furthermore, one of his more popular choices would see him reinstate St Dunstan as his political advisor, which would eventually see the saint promoted to the role of Archbishop of Canterbury. Having many of his responsibilities restored, and maintaining a good relationship with the king, Dunstan was able to introduce a large movement in favour of monastic reform. With his ideas that were implemented, all secular clergy were removed from their posts, and the churches were given significant independence from the crown, perhaps even a certain freedom that had not been enjoyed by church officials in the times before. Along with this, many of the monasteries that had been destroyed during the raids of the Vikings were rebuilt, and it might be said that had it not been for this period of peace that was maintained by King Edgar, then none of these projects would have gone ahead. Indeed, there do not appear to be any recorded conflicts during Edgar's time as king, hence his moniker, the Peaceful. It was perhaps with this absence of war that allowed him to focus his time in making progress in accelerating England into a secure state, and distant it from the time of the Dark Ages that had seen England descend into a country full of rival kingships and entities who existed outside of the general law. It was with his diplomacy that Edgar was able to secure England, and not the soldiering nor strategy that had been demonstrated by his father or grandfather when they were in power. Instead, Edgar worked alongside the thanes, eldermen, government nobles, and the church itself, in order to make a country that allowed everyone to prosper, as well as ensuring their safety. In fact, it might be said that with Edgar's rule, a certain standard was established in terms of law and politics. Interestingly, Yet another standard was set during Edgar's rule, and that was in regards to coronations. Whilst it was believed he had something of a formal induction into kingship, it wasn't until 10 years into his reign did he receive a major ceremony, perhaps one of the biggest coronations that any king of England had received thus far. These grand coronations would become a staple going forward for any man who ascended the throne and the man who lobbied for such a celebration to take place was none other than St Dunstan. Dunstan argued that England required these ceremonies on the basis that the French and the Germans both held such protocols in high regard 
when electing their own kings and emperors. Therefore, in an effort to glorify the King of England and attribute him to such heights as the other leaders in Europe, coronations became a part of not just royal etiquette, but public expectation. Yet as mentioned, Edgar did not receive his coronation for a whole 14 years into his rule, supposedly on the account that Dunstan was not satisfied with Edgar's behaviour either. Much like his brother Edwig, Edgar was thought to have demonstrated some unpious behaviour. There were rumours about his private life that had become something of gossip for the courts, those which included stories about his marriages. Supposedly, it was thought that he had married his childhood friend, Athelfleet, but that she had either died early into their marriage or that they had been separated, likely on the account that he had begun to have an affair with a noblewoman, Wolfrith of Wilton. It is disputed as to whether he went on to marry Wolfrith, especially considering that she was later venerated as a saint after becoming an abbess. With these two relationships, Edgar did have a son and daughter with both women respectively. The son being born to Athelfleet would be known as Edward, and would go on to become king, the infamous Edward the Martyr himself. The daughter who was born to Wolfrith was known as Edith of Wilton, she who was also venerated as a saint. With these two marriages, Edgar was thought to have begun to cultivate a bit of a scandalous reputation, something that St. Dunstan was keen to get rid of, especially considering how imperative it was for the king to appear both virtuous and faultless. Furthermore, it would not do to have a grand ceremony for a king who was living a seemingly moralless life, by marrying several women and fathering several children. But despite Dunstan's efforts, a third woman would present herself in the year 963, when Edgar met the infamous Elthrith, she who was a powerful political figure in her own right and the first woman to be crowned queen alongside her king. All of these women saw Dunstan convince Edgar to lead a more humble life, at least as far as women went, and it's possible that he was convinced by Dunstan to settle down with Elthrith. It would be another 10 years, however, until Dunstan seemed to be convinced, for it was only in the year 973 that the major ceremony that Dunstan had envisioned came to pass, where in the city of Bath, Edgar's coronation took place. Interestingly, we also see here the tradition of the king's wife also becoming queen, for what was the first time in English history a woman was crowned alongside her husband. This protocol and the ceremony involved with it essentially became the template for all married royals going forward, and has remained that way ever since. But rumours of Edgar's marriage to Elfrith would only get more and more sinister, especially with Dunstan trying to sweep things under the rug. Whilst the legends on such accounts are sketchy, it was believed that Edgar had heard rumours of Elfrith's beauty long before he had met her, but she was already linked with the Earl Aethelwald, he who was also his foster brother. When Edgar learned of this, he sent for the Earl to arrange his own marriage to her. But when Aethelwald disputed this, given the fact that he was already involved with her, Edgar killed him. In another legend, it is believed that after refusing to arrange the marriage between Aethelrith and Edgar, Aethelwald was mysteriously killed in a hunting accident, which allowed Edgar to marry Elthrith as he wanted. Since then, however, the tale has been often disputed amongst historians, with some citing it as an actual event that took place, and others dismissing it as romantic fiction. In any case, Edgar and Elthrith had two sons together, Edmund Elthling and another future king in Athelred the Unready. After his coronation, Edgar was rumoured to have his army march along the border of Wales, from Bath to Chester, in an effort to showcase his strength to the Welsh. Ironically, it may have been the most threatening use of his power that he used in his entire tenure as king. He also sailed his fleet through the Irish Sea, 
and sought to demonstrate his might to the Vikings, who still had strongholds at Dublin. With these shows of strength, it was believed the eight kings of Wales submitted to him, and that after they had conceded, they rode with Edgar along the River Dee, placing him at the helm of the ship to signify their acquiescence to him. With the ceremony setting the standard of English coronations, as well as marking the peaceful and prosperous reign of one of the country's most diplomatic kings thus far, you'd be correct in assuming that both the morale of the nation and the political climate were in a good place. But little did the English know that this was all just a calm before the storm. For the Danish, who had been beaten back in recent times, were now only biding their time. The era of harmony that Edgar had sowed through the land was about to be violently torn up by the roots, and the Saxon world was about to be thrust into chaos. Let me know what you thought about today's episode of Kings and Queens Explained, and as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.